Well, good morning and welcome to South Point Church. My name is Matt. We are one church in multiple locations. So I want to say good morning to our Leonardtown campus. Is anyone excited to be here this morning? All right. I want to say good morning to our Lusby campus. Hi, Lusby. We're so glad you're here with us today. For those of you watching on our YouTube channel, we're glad that you showed up. Um, hey, we have a little saying here at South Point Church, and we kind of say it regularly. Um, I haven't said it in a couple weeks, and I want to make sure that you know what this saying is. And it goes something like this. It really doesn't matter. We want you to know that no matter why you came today, South Point is a place where you can come as you are. But here's the good news, that none of us have to stay that way. It doesn't matter where you You've been because we believe good news is God is more concerned about where we're going than where we've been. And lastly, we think this is the greatest news to ever hit planet Earth. It doesn't matter what you've done or what's been done to you. Your life, my life, our life does not have to be defined by what's been done. Instead, our life can be defined by what Jesus already did on the cross. So if you only hear one thing from South Point this morning, we hope that you hear that you matter deeply to the heart of God. God. So we're so glad that you're here with us this morning. Hey, we're kicking off a brand new series called This Is Us. And the whole reason we named it This Is Us and the whole reason that we're doing this series is we want everyone that's a part of South Point to know kind of exactly what South Point is all about. We kind of want to go reveal kind of back, draw back the covers and the curtains and say, this is who we are. This is us. And you might be thinking, well, why would that be important to kind of know who's South Point is. And I think that's really important for two reasons. Here's two really important reasons. One is nobody wants to sit here for a couple of weeks. No one wants to sit here for a couple of months. No one wants to sit here for a couple of years and then later discover, oh, I didn't know you guys were about that. And then go, I just wasted all that time. So no one wants to waste their time. So you kind of want to know what we're about. And second of all, if anyone asks you, well, tell me about the church that you go to, you want it to be simple, right? You don't have to give a complicated, crazy, like Christianese lingo. You just want to be able to simply explain what our church is about. And so over the next several weeks, we're going to be doing this series called This Is Us so you know exactly who it is that we think we want God for us to be and who we are as a church. Now, as I was thinking about this title, This Is Us, I was actually reminded of a time when my girls were little. I have two little girls and uh, they're teens now. And do I have any other parents who have teens? Right? We should pray for it together. We should have like a recovery group for each other, right? Because parenting teens isn't, isn't easy, right? My teens are actually really awesome. I love my daughters. They're, they're, they're killing it, right? But I remember when they were little. And do you remember when your kids were little? When your kids are little, like they always are trying new things. Whenever they try new things, it's always like an accident happens, but that's okay. And I used to have this little saying when my kids were growing up. I said, halls are overcomers. You can do it. And the idea was, is when they would try something new, they would always go, mommy, daddy, can you help me? And it was never dead. Daddy, look, can we be honest? They never ask for dad. They always like mommy, right? But mommies get tired of hearing mommy and daddies get tired of hearing daddy. And so one of the things that we want our kids to do was to be able to know how to do things on their own. And so we said, listen, halls are overcomers. You can do it. And so when they would try something and they'd say, hey, mommy or daddy help, we would turn to them and go, you're a hall. You're an overcomer. You can do it. And here's what I knew. Even as a kind of not a great parent, as someone who had never raised kids before with my first kids, I decided listen, I know it's important to teach my kids values because it's impossible. Listen, you know this. It's an impossible thing for a parent to teach a kid about every situation that they will run into. It's impossible. So you can't cover every situation. So as parents, what we want to do is we want to give our kids values, right? So that whatever happens, they have a lens in which to see through so that they can continue to make good choices. Matter of fact, whatever values we have, will determine how we act and behave. Now I want you to understand, this isn't like some church idea. This isn't some religious thought. This is kind of a universal truth. Matter of fact, I want to share a quote I found with you. It doesn't even come from a Christian. Like if you read it, you think, man, did that come from the Bible? Um, but it doesn't. I'm going to put the quote up here on the screen. It says, your values form the foundation of your life. I mean, think about that phrase. The values form the foundation of your life. They dictate the choices you make and determine the direction of your life and that it takes. What you value forms the foundation and it steers the direction of your life. Your values influence your decisions related to your relationships, your career, and other activities you engage in. And that doesn't come from church or the Bible. That was in Psychology Today, May of 2012. And here's the funny thing. 
is we didn't need social science to tell us. The Bible's been telling us this truth since the beginning. Matter of fact, it leads us to something. You, listen, you didn't need to come to. You already knew this. What we value, we're going to put it on the screen. What we value will determine who we become. The sum of who you are today is because of the values that you've picked. What we value will determine who we become. Now, here's what I discovered. I thought about that. And then I said, oh, that sounds really good. But then I realized sometimes I'm not the person I want to be. And I was like, why sometimes am I not the person I want to be? Because the opposite is this also is true. Sometimes, it's coming, sometimes we're not the person. Has anyone ever not been the person they, they wanted to be? Okay, I've seen you all out there. Come on, everyone raise your hand. Come on, like, like sometimes we're not the person. When you go to Walmart, you're not the person you want to be, right? Right? Sometimes we're not the person we want to be because we have values that don't line up. I mean, come on, let's be honest. Maybe we think, listen, I really want to be an honest person. But sometimes we're not honest because we value money more than honesty. Sometimes we picture ourselves as I'm a person of integrity, but we value sensuality over integrity. Sometimes we're not the person we want to be because we go, listen, 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 I, I want to value bravery. I want to be a brave person, but we really value self-preservation. And so sometimes we're not the person we want to be because the values that we have don't line up with the picture of we want to be, which leads us to a tension or a truth this morning that we've all, listen, I've experienced this, you've experienced this, listen, everyone in the room has experienced this. Having or sometimes having mismatched values will keep us from becoming the person we want to be. When you and I have a picture of the person we want to be, and then we don't have values that align or mismatched values, we never become this person that we envision ourselves being. And we'll only ever become the person that we envision is when our values are lined up. And so the real question is, is to become who we want to be, then we need to have the values that lead to the picture of who we see. And you might be going, Matt, what does this have to do with South Point Church? It leads me to this truth. You see, here's what's true about me. Here's what's true about you. What's true about us as individuals is also true of us as a group. Think about it. Whatever church we're going to be is going to be driven by the... Whatever kind of church we're going to be is going to be driven by the values that we have. And it's not the values that are on a piece of paper. They're not the values that, that we wish. They're the values that we actually practice. And so the reality is, is having mismatched values will keep us, the church from being who God wants us to be. And it got me thinking, if we're supposed to be who God wants us to be, but we don't have the right values, then we'll never end up where we want to be. And so I was thinking, how do we make sure, how do we solve this? How do we make sure we have values as a church, as a corporate, as a group? Listen, and by the way, I just want to say something. A church is not a building. Can I get an amen? Ch church is not a building. Church is not an organization. Can I get an Amen. Church is a group of followers of Jesus. It's a community of people, right? And so what are the values that we as a community of people have that will lead to us becoming the church that God wants us to be? And I thought about it. How can we make sure that we don't have mismatched values? The first thing we have to do is we have to identify what are the core values? We have to be able to, everyone has, we have to be able to say those. We have to be able to articulate them. We have to go, what is it that we value? And then everyone who considers themselves part of South Point or is considering being part of South Point has to know what these values are. So over the next several weeks, here's what we're going to do. We're going to talk about the five core values that South Point Church has. One, so that we're really clear on what they are. And two, everyone will know them. And you're probably like, well, why is that important? Well, the great thing is then none of you will waste your time. We won't get to a value and you go, well, I don't really like that. And you'll go, I shouldn't stay because that's something they value. And you won't have wasted your time. No one likes to waste their time. And when all of us know the values, all of us can be heading in the same direction. It's important that we all go in the same direction. So everyone knows we have clarity and we're all going in the same direction. This is us. Who are we meant to be? So over the next several weeks, we're going to cover these five core values. And this morning, I couldn't wait to do this one because this is our number one South Point core value. And we're going to put them on the screen. It's on your insert if you're following along, right? Jesus is a big deal. Yes. 
By the way, I just, I just need everyone to understand something before I, before I listen. All of these five core values aren't new. There are things that have been valued at South Point since the beginning. We just want to make sure we put language and clarity so that everyone is on the same page. Jesus is a big deal. Matter of fact, can we just be honest? At, at, at the end of the day, South Point, listen, we want to have really friendly people. Like when you come in, we want there to be greeters as you come into the parking lot. We, we want people to smile and, and shake your hand. We want people, to, and they're not there just to shake your hand. They're there to welcome you and see you. We want people to pass out donuts. We want them to be fresh and good, not because of donuts, but you feel like you've been welcomed. We want, we want ushers and their job isn't necessarily to pass out bulletins. So their, their, their thing is to help you and help you know that you are valued. And we want worship that is engaged and relevant. We want it to be excellent. We want the message to be engaging and have a little bit of humor and have truth and be impactful. But at the end of the day, a church service is not what we have to offer. At the end of the day, the only thing South Point has to offer to you is Jesus. Jesus is a big deal. And here's why Jesus is a big deal. Life change. Life changed. We all showed up going, listen, I want to become the person I want to be, but I realize that sometimes I'm not the person I want to be. How do I become the person I want to be? Life change is possible because God gave his best. Y'all, somebody ought to say amen. I mean, God gave his best for us, so we give our best for him. And as I was thinking about this, Jesus is a big deal. I mean, that is the core of everything we want to do. We want to point you to a person not to a religion, not to an organization, not to politics or economics or social things. We want to point you to a person, and his name is Jesus. Jesus is a big deal. And here's why Jesus is a big deal. And I'm going to share this from Scripture. And we kind of catch this in the eyewitness account of the Gospel of Luke, okay? And here's what I'm going to do. I just want to kind of set you up for what I'm going to do. I'm going to kind of read the Scripture so you go, oh, this is in the eyewitness account. This thing, this really happened. We have the historical evidence. And then I want to kind of break down what that means because where do we get this idea that Jesus is a big deal? That it comes straight from Scripture. It's not my idea. It's not, not the elders' idea. It's not you know, some staff's idea. It's not some you know, people in the audience. Like, this, this comes straight from the Bible. So we're going to pick it up in the eyewitness account of the Gospel of Luke. It said, two other men, both criminals, also were led out with him, that's being Jesus, to be executed. I'm going to stop right here. Jesus showed up on the planet Earth. He is God in the flesh. He left heaven, the comfort of heaven. And he showed up on a busted and broken planet, not because he had to, but because he wanted to reach out to his creation that he loved. And by the way, I just want to say something, because I don't want anyone to feel pity for Jesus. Listen, no one took and put Jesus on the cross. Jesus went to the cross willingly. He said, hey, listen, I can call my heavenly father, and I'll have 12 legions of angels. I'll wreck shop. Like, I'm on this cross willingly. So I don't want there to be any pity, anyone to feel sad. Jesus chose us because he loved us. And when they came to the place called the skull, they crucified him. They don't even go into the depths of what crucifixion was and how horrific and painful it was. It just says they crucified him. There along with other criminals, one on his right and the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. By the way, when you are in immense pain and you are suffering unjustly, whatever comes out of you is usually at the core of your character. And what comes out of the core of Jesus when he is unjustly condemned, he's being tortured. We see the character and the heartbeat of God in this God-man Jesus, God in the flesh. Father, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. The people stood watching, and the rulers even sneered at him. They said, he saved others. Let him save himself if he is God's Messiah, the chosen one. The soldiers also came up and mocked him. They offered him wine vinegar and said, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was a written notice above him which read this, the king of the Jews. And by the way, I just need to do a little bit of historical stuff. The Roman soldiers in the ancient world knew that the king of the Jews was supposed to be the Messiah of the world because of some events that had happened in previous history. I don't have the time to go in that. But, but even secular people knew that when the Messiah or the king of the Jews showed up, he would be the ruler of the world. One of the criminals who hung there also hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. So there's another thief who's being crucified and he says, Jesus, come on, really? Like if you really are, you say you are, get us out of this jam. Me too, please. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God since you were under the same sentence? We are punished justly. Now I'm going to stop here. 
See, this is the problem. All of us here know that none of us are perfect, right? We, we've all messed. We, we, we've all at some point in our lives said, I know that this was wrong and I'm going to do it anyway. And for God to be really God, then God has to be a God of justice. And when God is a God of justice, that means when you break the law or break the rules and you're not perfect, there is a penalty. We all know that. And that's where the jam comes in. But God's also supposed to be loving, right? If, we're, if there were children of God, if he really does love us, then, then he wouldn't separate us from him forever because everything that is good and right and just and true is with God and everything that isn't is away from him. So I wouldn't want to be away from that. That place is called hell. We're getting what our deeds deserve, but this man has done nothing wrong. Jesus was innocent. Then he said, Jesus... Remember me when you come into your kingdom. And I want to stop right there. And the next sentence is some of the most beautiful words in all of history. Not just in the Bible, not just in any book. They are some of the most beautiful words in all of history. We pick up what Jesus responds and he says, Jesus answered him, truly. Need you to understand, this is some truth. I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. You want to know why Jesus is a big deal? Because life is busted and broken. And he's the only one that can undo all of that. Hold on. Think about this. Here's a thief on a cross. What is the trajectory of his life? Brokenness, sadness, criminal. He's, he's on his, he's dying. He's hung on a cross. He's alone, he's guilty, he's shame-filled, and he's about to face death, and he's about to cross over the veil and spend eternity separated from the God who made him and loves him. And if there had been no Jesus on the cross, that would have been the story of his life. Destruction, death, sadness, loss, shame, regret. But we see what a relationship with Jesus looks like in just three simple things. First, the thief identifies. He says, listen, listen, I get it. I'm not innocent. If you want to know what it means to follow Jesus, you just see it in the thief's response. The thief says, listen, I get it. I'm not innocent. And then he looks at Jesus and says, but you are. And you're taking my place. He acknowledges his guilt, Jesus, in it, and then he says, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He identifies Jesus as the king of kings the rightful ruler of the universe. And what does Jesus do? I mean, the, the thief didn't get baptized. I think we should get baptized. The thief didn't read a Bible. I think we should read the Bible. The thief didn't go to church. I think we should go to church. The thief didn't do any good deeds. I think we should do some good deeds. The thief didn't put any money in the offering. I think we should put some money in the offering. Like, the thief didn't do anything to earn forgiveness, did he? Because you and I can't earn forgiveness. We can't earn redemption. It is a free gift. Jesus says, truly I tell you today, you'll be with me in paradise. And some of you might be thinking, how did that change that thief's life? Well, I promise you, not only did it change it for eternity, it changed it in the moment. Because think about it. If you're a criminal who's being hanged naked in front of Romans, as kind of a warning to never do that again, are you going to show up? You don't want to be associated with that. If he's, if he's somebody that you know, he's a criminal, and you don't want to be associated with him because the Romans would hang you up too. There's probably nobody there to watch him. He was probably going to die alone. But in that moment that Jesus says, truly I tell you today with you being the marriage, he had a friend. As he was going and as, as he died physically, he no longer was alone. He had Jesus as a friend. Think about it. Had he not met Jesus and had that conversation, he would have died in his guilt and his shame. He would have never, ever found forgiveness. But as he was dying, he was at peace because the king of kings had forgiven him freely. That, that guilt, that shame was taken away. And lastly, here's what I think. Even though he was in deep suffering, I probably bet he had more joy in those last few moments of life than he ever did because he knew where his eternity was. It was secure and that he would see the king of kings on the other side. 
And not only was that short little brief time changed by the encounter with Jesus, his eternity was changed by his encounter with Jesus. Which leads me to just a simple truth today. And this is why Jesus is a big deal. The thief's what? What is that word? The thief's relationship with Jesus was life-changing. The only way to become who it is that we want to be is to have a relationship with Jesus. Because life is busted and broken. Matter of fact, Jesus says these, these are Jesus' words. These are, these are not my words. The eyewitness account of the Gospel of John. John was a follower of Jesus. He followed him and he recorded the words of Jesus. Jesus says this. Jesus answered, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus is a big deal because he's the way, the truth, and the life. And there's no way to have a relationship with our Heavenly Father. There's no way to experience eternal life apart from a person named Jesus. So this morning I want to do something. I want to kind of explain, like, listen, Jesus is he's the way, he's the truth, and the life. I just want to, I want to clear, have some honesty here. And here's why Jesus is a big deal. Because life is busted, right? So sometimes, observation number one, sometimes we can't stop the brokenness of life. I bet every single person in this room has a story of pain that you wish you didn't experience, but life brought it on you anyway. Is there, yeah, somebody's honest, right? Sometimes we can't stop the brokenness of life. And if we, if I could spend time with you individually and hear all your stories, every single person in this room would have a story of pain where life came and it hurt you and you didn't want it. And the great thing is you don't have to have me. You can get in small groups where you're in six or eight or 12 people and you can have a place to share your story where Jesus can step in and bring healing and life. But sometimes we can't stop the brokenness of life. I bet if I listened to you, you would tell me a story about divorce that you never planned on your wedding day. You never thought it would end that way. I bet you could tell me a story of a loved one that you cared for that passed away suddenly and tragically. I bet if I listened hard enough, some of you would tell me about a wayward child or a wayward relative or family member whose addiction or brokenness has caused destruction in your family. I bet if I listened to the stories, I would hear you tell me, listen, I got an illness or sickness I never planned on. and It was life-changing and it's painful and it's hard. And I didn't want it. You see, here's the truth. None of us ever want to say it, but sometimes we can't stop the brokenness of life. I don't care how much education. I don't care how much money you have. I don't care who your parents are, where you live, the language you speak. Listen, sometimes we can't stop the brokenness of life. I came from a divorced family. My mom died when I was young. I got sick at the worst time in my career with an illness that lasted over two years. My wife and I experienced miscarriage. Listen, just because you follow Jesus doesn't mean that sometimes we can't stop the brokenness of life. And this is harsh and we don't like it, but we don't have the power to stop this, do we? Now we have the power to not make stupid decisions. <laughs> Say amen. Like, right, like we can all admit, like some of the brokenness we, we get because it's the consequences of our poor choices. But other times it's, we didn't ask for it, we didn't want it, and it just showed up. And we're powerless. We don't have the power to, to fix the brokenness of this world. Which leads me to observation number two. Sometimes we can't find the way that leads to the right destination. How many of us thought him or her was the right person? And it didn't turn out right. How many of us thought, man, if I chased wealth, if I just had enough money, it would solve my problems? How many of us thought, man, if I just get enough achievement, that hole on the inside of me will be filled? If I have just enough fun, if I have just enough pleasure, so we choose these paths, but sometimes we can't find the way that leads to the right destination. We chose a path, and when we get to the end, it's like sand that falls to our fingers, and we go, I thought when I ended up here, it would be different. Or even worse, we end up in a place we never wanted because we got on a path that we thought would lead one way, but it actually led somewhere else. True story, just the other day I was traveling and I actually happened to be out of state. It was in Virginia and we didn't know where we were going. So we, we were using GPS and we went to this place that we were going. We went to the website. We got their address, but it was the wrong address on the website. And we showed up at the wrong place. And some of us think we're heading in the right direction, but if we're honest, sometimes we can't. We can't find the way that leads to the destination of the place that we want to be. 
If we are really honest, sometimes we're powerless. We're powerless to know ahead of time, is the path that we're on the right path? And then observation number three, sometimes we can't see the truth through all the chaos. Right? Come on. Sometimes we can't see the truth. Here's what I've discovered. All of us have blind spots. I remember when I was a young guy, my mom and dad, my adopted mom and dad who took me in would always tell me I was just bad at relationships. And they would always tell me, hey, man, like you, you have a, you, your picker is really bad right now. You, you need to change. And I was like, I know what I'm doing. And then it, would, then it would end poorly. And they would say, see, I told you so. And I'm like, okay. And then the next time they'd say, hey, remember last time I got it right and you got it wrong? And I'd be like, no, I got it right this time. I know what I'm doing. I can see clearly. Isn't it funny? It's always easy to see everyone else when they're about to mess up and we can't see when we're, am I the only person that happens to? Like, it's so easy when you look at somebody else, you go, man, what's wrong with them? Can't they see where that's going to, like, can't they see the truth? But the reality is, is we all have blind spots in our own lives because there's so much chaos, there's so much noise. Everything is saying, do it your way. It feels so good, it can't be wrong. And that is a lie. Sometimes if we're honest, we can't see the truth. And if we are really honest, sometimes we're powerless because of things that have happened or sometimes we fool ourselves and we, we can't see the truth. And this is why Jesus is a big deal. Because he is life. In the midst of the brokenness, life steps in and his name is Jesus. In the midst when we can't find the way, Jesus says, I am the way. Jesus says, listen, if you obey me, you'll discover whether I'm from God or not. And he says, I am the truth. Jesus doesn't tell people what they want to hear to be popular. Jesus tells them the hard truth so they can experience the life that they want. Jesus is the way, he's the truth, and he's the life. He takes this busted and broken world and he brings the way, the truth, and the life inside of us so that we can begin to experience this eternal life, not someday, but in the here and now. Let me just let me sum it up. Why Jesus is a big deal. There's only one person. Listen, I want to be really clear. Your grandma can't do it for you. Your mama can't do it for you. Your daddy, your pastor can't do it for you. Ain't just because you meet with me, talk with me, have me like be your friend. Like, listen, if you met me, you know how much I need Jesus. Your spouse can't do it for you. Amen. Your politicians can't do it for you. Can I? There's only one person that has the power to fix what's wrong with us. And his name is Jesus. I mean, think about it. There's been a lot of different governments, haven't there, throughout the ages. And here's what you and I know. Politics can't solve what's broken. Some of y'all act like you don't believe me. I promise you, politics can't fix what's broken because if they could have, they already... You guys are so smart. If they could have, they already would have. Listen, there's no economical solution to what's wrong. Because if there was, there's been really, really wealthy people. But economics doesn't fix what's at the heart of the problem, which is the human heart. There's no social thing that will fix the human condition. Because if we could have, we... There's no technological advancement that will fix what's wrong with the human heart. Because if we could have, we... Then listen, you could educate kids younger and younger on what's right and what's wrong and this and that. But education wouldn't have solved it because if it could have, it would have... It would have. At the end of the day, the reason why the number one value at South Point Church is Jesus is a big deal because he's the only one who can fix what's wrong. Now here's the thing. When God sent Jesus, it was a bold, risky plan. And here's why. There was a second thief. Did you catch that in the story? There was a second thief who rejected Jesus. I mean, think about this. God sent his one and only son who left the comfort and convenience of heaven, was born in a human suit, experienced all the bustedness and brokenness of this life, 
was separated for, from his heavenly Father and the Holy Spirit. The Trinity was separated for only one time in, in eternity when Jesus took on the sin of the world, your sin, my sin, our sin. And Jesus and God did that knowing that some would not choose the gift. What a bold, risky, all-in move. And when God sent Jesus, he didn't send second best or heaven's leftovers. He gave his best. And see, I just, I just, this is going to be a little bit hard. And so like if I rant right now, just please forgive me. But I don't understand why it's okay for Apple to be excellent and to go the extra mile so that they can make a product so you can pay $1,000 for it. Because what they want in the end is your dollars. Right? Why is it okay for a musical artist to have a great stage and a great show and have all these backup singers and mix their music really great so that they can have a song, so the song gets played, so they can make some what? Or maybe be famous. Make money, be famous. But as soon as the church wants to do anything with some excellence, as soon as the church wants to do anything that is great, people go, well, why do we have to do that? Well, I don't know. An iPhone won't change your eternity. I don't know. That song won't change your eternity. That new clothes that you're wearing won't change your eternity. That new TV that you have won't change your eternity. That new car won't change your eternity. But I do know one thing that will change your eternity. Jesus. So I just want, I just want to be really clear because, because at South Point, like if this isn't you, that's okay. But I just want you to know now so that if you choose to stay, you can know what South Point's about because God gave his best for us so we don't give God our junk or our leftovers. I know it'd get quiet. We don't do halfway at South Point. At South Point, listen, if you found the cure for cancer, you wouldn't go, oh, I should be shy about it. I should do it halfway. You would do whatever it took to get that cure so that people would never experience the loss and the pain of cancer. Yet we have the cure to what's broken in the world. And sometimes we're like, eh, I'll do it halfway. So at South Point, I need you to know, because God gave his best for us, we're going to give his best for him. And, and here's what it means. It means we're not going we're, we're like, to let fear, we're not going to let fear cause us to hide in little church huddles. We're actually going to engage the world and we're actually going to talk about topics that the world needs to talk about, even when it's uncomfortable. Because the last time I checked, it wasn't about how comfortable we were. Jesus probably wasn't comfortable on the cross. We're not going to settle for safe dreams and small dreams and safe living. God showed up and he changed the world and he impacted eternity. Why would we settle for small dreams and safely. Why would we dream big that God wants to use us to change this planet and point people to him? We will not compromise for comfort or for convenience. We will not let those things kill our passion to see our world become what God intended it to be. At South Point, we believe that excellence without extravagance honors God and inspires people. We will go all out at the end of the day, we'll spend everything we'll have and we'll give a little bit of extra so that when we see Jesus, we'll go, we left nothing on the field of life for you, Jesus. You gave your best for us and we'll give our best for you because we believe you're the only thing that can fix what's busted and broken in this world. Jesus. So I want to ask you, what's your number one value? Is your number one value Jesus? Because if Jesus is your number one value, everything else in life will fall into place. But if Jesus isn't your number one value, I want to ask, will you end up where you want to be? I know for South Point Church that as long as we're here and I get to be a part of this thing that God is doing, our number one value will always be that Jesus is a big deal. And because God gave his best for us, we will give our best for him because we believe that people matter deeply to him. So I just want you to know that because this is us. Let me pray. <laughs> Heavenly Father, thank you. 
God, you didn't wait for us to come to you. We created this problem. We left you. We disobeyed. We said we want to do life our own way, and so we have all this brokenness. But because of your great love, God, because of your great love, regardless of the brokenness, regardless if we didn't get on the right path, regardless if we, we fell for the lies and we couldn't find truth, you chose to do the ridiculous, the risky, the amazing. You sent your son and he paid our price. He was innocent and we're guilty. And he offers us forgiveness freely and that we can find life we can find the way and we can find truth in your son, Jesus, that there's mercy and grace and there's life. Thank you for that. At the center of who South Point is, may Jesus always be our number one value. We love you and thank you and pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you're ready to take the next step in your spiritual journey or continue to support South Point, you can connect to a small group, serve on a team, and give financially by clicking the box on the right. To watch other sermons from South Point Church, click the playlist on the left. Click the logo to subscribe.